done on the video was <coughs> still <coughs> yes. warm up this morning. Uh, uh, I should say, <coughs> if you do feel really cold, then an experiment with where you sit, because the folk in the middle here are caught on. And those who are sitting out in the edges, uh, really the, or, I mean, in the box at the back there, uh, are, are probably at the most disadvantage. It's, it's warmer than it is the way it works. Anyway, um, it's good to be together. What a beautiful morning. And a lot to be thankful. We do, as I said, and uh, you know, remember our friends on the Karen Alp Cross. We this morning on the Karen Alp Cross with their new minister, Reverend Colin McLeod, and his wife Jessie. I think they work there. And I'm um, the uh, building that they've been longing for for so long uh, has finally been opened and today we have the first services there. Uh, so that's good. Anyway, we're here together to worship God. Uh, we've got a new theme starting this morning. Um, we're going to be asking, what is human nature? And uh, part of that is just knowing that we are creatures and that we are in the creator's world. And we are in his world. And he has given us everything that we have. And that's what we're going to sing about in Psalm 148. Uh, calls on all of creation to give praise to God. So we'll begin. And um, if you can't stand, we'll start. I'll sing Psalm 148 to God. <coughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. Uh, six weeks seem like two weeks here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you give me a bit more volume, please. I don't seem to be coming up very, very loud. Yeah. Okay. I've <coughs> got a box of a few things in this box. And uh, if anyone wants to pick out something, sort of copy, pick out something, whatever you want, very, very careful. So that rock actually is a very, very, very old rock, and it's got inside it lots and lots of little bits of shell. In fact, I've got some more here, a couple more here. There's one, pretty much a mussel shell or something that we didn't get <coughs> from a very, very long time ago. And this one's got a shell here. You can find these over on the other side of Broadway. Piles of them over there. And they're on the rocks and shore. And these belong to animals that lived an enormous time ago. Have you got Chrissy? Have you got to hold that one up? Uh, what's it got in it? Can you see something in it? There's little patterns in it, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of. So that's actually part of a big shell. A big shell, a big circular shell. And called an ammonite. And uh, you can get them. That's one of my son Kenny's collection of crosses. He's got another one here, which is really nice. Small. You can see. You can see that? Yeah, you see the shell there. Yeah. Yeah. See the spirals of the shell. And this shell, this shell would have lived a very, very, very long time ago. Long, long, long before there were people around. Very, very long time ago indeed. Yeah, and I've got some other fossils here that are little shells. I couldn't find them, but I had some more, but I couldn't find them. So these all belong, all these things belong to <coughs> animals. Animals that lived in the sea, uh, most of them there, uh, and uh, animals that were once swimming around, moving around, living happily. And that is all that's left of them. Not very much. <coughs> 
Now, that's really what it's like for animals everywhere. Yeah, your animals that you see, maybe a deer you see, or a bird, or a fish you catch. And they all end up just like nothing, really. And the animals don't care for one another in any way once they die. Once animals die, you know, they move off and they leave them. But we're different. You and I are different. We're not like animals. So, here's a picture to think about. Now, this is a picture of my mother's tombstone up in Berlin. So, this is my mom. And uh, anything you can see about that, that animals don't do. Animals don't do when, when their mothers die or whatever. Anything about that grave so that's different at all. Would animals put up a gravestone? No. No. They're different. They don't, they don't think about those that have died in the way we do. We know that someone has died, it's not like the end of the story. Yes, we want to say who they were and who they were, the precious mother and granny and how long they lived. But look at the words at the bottom. And then you read them off. What does it say at the bottom? And you can tell them. What's it easy to press the button? It's happy. Until the resurrection. <coughs> now that really does tell you that we're very, very different to animals. Because animals don't put up gravestones. And if they did put up gravestones, uh, well, they can't write and read like we can. Like Patrick with his book there. Animals can't do that, so Patrick's definitely not an animal. You're a person. Great. Person noisy. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to come and finish off from here? <laughs> yeah, right, that's great. Okay, you hold that. Don't press any button, Jeff. Right. No, don't press any. You can press that one in a minute when I tell you. Okay, so there's more to us than animals. We grew up gravestone. We remember the people have died and we have hope as well and because my mother uh, was a lady who in her later life became a follower of Jesus and loved Jesus and trusted Jesus, I know that when Jesus comes back at the day of the resurrection, he's going to raise her out of that grave <coughs> along with all those who trust him. And she's got a future. And I also know that although her body is there, but even here of it, she is with Jesus right now in spirit. Now, animals just aren't like that. We are totally, completely different to animals. Do you want to press that button now? <coughs> Thank you, Pat. You can put, put it down there and sit down. That was a great help, Pat. Thank you. I wonder, can you read that? What does that say? What does that say, Pat? Jesus was dying on the cross, there was another man dying beside him, what a thief. And this thief turned to Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Which is an amazing thing to say, because Jesus was about to die. So, and yet the man believed Jesus was about to come into his kingdom. And Jesus saw the man, believed in him, trusted him, and said to him, today, like today they were both going to be buried. Jesus in his tomb, I don't know where the thief got put, but Jesus said, today, we're not going to be here just as bodies, we're not just going to be bones, we're not just going to be lying around like, like uh, decaying animals or creatures eventually turning into stones or whatever, we're not going to be doing that, Jesus said, we're going to be leaving our bodies and we're going to be going to heaven, thanks for saying, we're going to be going to heaven. And animals just are not like that. This is a totally different thing. To be a human being is to be something very, very special, wonderful, and different. And that is a great thing for us to, to think about this morning. What a special gift we have. Great to have animals around. We all love the animals uh, that are in our lives. Whether it's a spark here, you know, whether it's a uh, um, birds we see in our bird feeders and you know the, <coughs> the sheep in the fields of 
whatever it is. We love them, but they're not like us. God has made us. He made us to be able to know Him, to read and write, to look forward to being with Him forever. <coughs> and He's made us body and spirit, so we can leave our bodies and then return to our bodies when Jesus raises us up. Wonderful to be a human being and wonderful to have Jesus. Amen? Yeah? Is that true? <laughs> it is true. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Our Lord, we worship you. Thank you for this day. It's beautiful. Maybe we've had a wee bit of difficulty getting here, getting our cars defrosted or uh, watching we can slip on the ice. But thank you, Lord, we've got here safely. And thank you, Lord, that we've enjoyed uh, the bright sunshine, and the sparkling ice crystals hanging on the trees. And um, thank you, Lord, for all your gifts to us this morning. And thank you for how special it is to be human beings. As Father said, I'm not an animal, I'm a person. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for being persons uh, in your presence this morning with, with uh, spirits that live forever and bodies that you will raise from the dead. So, Lord, help us to realize how special we really are. We're going to sing a, a song now, Thank You Jesus, uh, which uh, well, I feel thankful this morning. Uh, so you always feel thankful in the morning, but I feel thankful this morning. So let's thank you for what he's done for us. Um, and he was a person who loved us, who died for us, and goes again for us, and is coming again. Thank you, Jesus.
prayer meeting on Wednesday night in the church hall, Open Door Cafe on Friday. Uh, next Sunday, I hope to take the morning service at half ten here, and um, DJ <coughs> Stewart will take the evening service in Kalakin at half five. Uh, uh, the Comfort and Joy books, there's maybe one or two left, uh, which just have a study from Isaiah 40 to 55. Uh, if you want to take one of them, there's still a couple left, and just work through it day by day from now until Christmas. You're, you're very welcome. And if you want to take one to give to a friend, then please do that. And pray God's blessing on it. We're going to read together. Uh, we're going to read from uh, God's Word in Genesis 2. I don't know why I'm really feeling so joyous and bouncing here, because I'm not responsible for a cat and that will cross That's definitely, definitely a plus to be. Uh, I'm looking forward to having it more time. Uh, here. My brain just doesn't do all these things all at once very well. So, uh, we're going to read in Genesis. And so, like I said, I want to think today about human nature. Because I keep, I've been reminded many times in the last few months that there doesn't seem to be an understanding in society of what human nature is. And that is causing all kinds of problems. So that things are going wrong, and no one ever asks, what's wrong with the people? They always have someone to blame, or something to blame. Instead of asking, well, why are people doing that? Why are they like that? What is human nature? <coughs> this seems to be such a basic question to ask, but we don't like asking that question because if you ask it, uh, the answers may not be the answers that you want to hear. We all like to think better of ourselves, perhaps, than is true. Let's read from Genesis. Uh, this is a good beginning for human nature. And God has, in Genesis 1, um, been busy creating. And he's made everything up until man, really. Uh, and this is a kind of poetic uh, sort of structure of presenting creation uh, to those who first read it, and to us today as well. Uh, it doesn't need to be understood in a sense of being uh, literal, that there was 24 hour days, because um, it's just a structure, and obviously the days weren't even present in the early days of Genesis in the sense of the way we stand on earth and see days. Uh, it's, it's a structure, it's a picture of God developing more and more complicated things and wonderful things in his creation until uh, he comes to uh, this pivotal, crucial moment in the creation. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and all the earth, sorry, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day made it holy, because on it 
that he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. <clears throat> this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Amen. For that passage in the Bible. We're going to pray together. And I'm just going to wake off because there's something in my throat. So. Let's pray. We want to thank you, Lord, this morning for being uh, persons, for being people. You made us in your image. We thank you that means that we can relate not only to one another, but to you. We thank you, you've shown that to us by sending Jesus who was both God and man. And we thank you, Lord, for the connection that we have with you, our Heavenly Father, through him, that we meet him as a man, and he meets you as your son, and we thank you that he stands between us, he intercedes, he speaks to you on our behalf, and he speaks to us on your behalf. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the privilege of this, we thank you, Lord, for what it means to be made in your image today. We thank you for your gifts, because we know, Lord, that, uh, or we think, Lord, anyway, as far as we can understand, that creation is not something that you had to do. You didn't need to make anything. And you didn't need to make a world with people in it. You didn't need to make uh, things that knew that they existed. Uh, you could have made just uh, inanimate objects, things that just sit there and don't know that they're sitting there. But you made us, and we're aware, we're awake, and we know who we are. We know that we're not someone else, and we know that uh, we have a, a, a place in our homes and communities and church and work. And we know, Father, uh, our past, and we, we remember things, we look forward to things in the future. We thank you for this moment, for our consciousness at this moment, and we pray that you'll make us very conscious that we are creatures in the Creator's world, and very grateful for all your gifts to us, for life, and for daily bread, and for the blessings that we have in this world of a beautiful day, and of uh, one another, and community, and the blessings we have of a Saviour can say to us on the day that we leave this world, today you will be with me in paradise. Heavenly Father, we worship you for these things. Pray for the church in the area today and pray that the church may be a rejoicing church and the church, Lord, that trusts you deeply. And we pray for our friends down the road in the Church of Scotland and we ask, Lord, that you will encourage them at a time, Lord, for one of their dear, dearly loved members is no longer with them. And we pray that you will uh, bless them in their worship this morning. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you'll uh, remember our friends across the Nakata and not across make the communion they share this morning very precious. We pray that straight off that there will be people in church who haven't been in church for a very long time in Nakata and not across. And we pray, Father, that uh, there will be great encouragement today for them all. And, uh, uh, Father, even from the very beginning, we pray for people to become Christians uh, through the work of the church here. We are blessed and we are calling and Jesse as they settle into the community and as they uh, begin their work. Remember to put tree, Lord. Remember the congregation here after so many years of uh, having to come in and set up and worship and empty everything down and tidy away again. Thank you, Lord, that they have their own building now. Thank you, Father, that they can serve the community around them with a base. And we pray that that building
Lily will be uh, used for many things. And we pray your anointing and Johnny G for good health, for strength, and for encouragement. Thank you for the three new members we had at the communion last week. And pray, Father, for the Holy Spirit to be at work in, in mighty in the tree and in the congregation there today. Help the Lord just to uh, uh, deal with any uh, sort of te teething issues uh, with uh, even the, the worshipers. They've been so busy this week getting everything ready. And we pray, Lord, that their focus will be on you, not on the building, Lord, because we know buildings uh, are just tools uh, for us uh, to use in your work. I pray, Father, for uh, your blessing with Willie as he preaches down in sleep this morning. Murdo as well, thank you for his visit to uh, Muhammad. Uh, we pray for Muhammad and his sister Shafika and for your love and care there. Thank you for the money that's uh, been sent out from us uh, to help her and her family in their desperate uh, plight. Have mercy, Lord, please, to the whole nation of Afghanistan, to the women of, of, of the children of Afghanistan, Lord, uh, to those who have been very um, evilly oppressed, Lord. Father, have mercy. Please, have mercy, Lord. And uh, have mercy across our world today in its troubles. Uh, Lord, we pray for those at the COP28 summit. We pray that they will uh, truly get to grips, Lord, with the, the emergency that we're just sliding into just now. And please, Father, Help them to, to make good decisions and to really care for countries that are experiencing uh, total destruction of their wild partners, drought and famine, and uh, displacement of peoples already. Heavenly Father, have mercy. Lord, we look up to you now. We pray you'll continue to guide us in this service. Forgive our sins, Lord, because, Lord, another part of our human nature, Lord, is we confess that we uh, see things that we want, that we say that we mustn't have. And uh, we don't believe that it's good for us to obey you, and we want to uh, do our own thing, as though we knew better than you. Have mercy upon us. Forgive our sins, and continue with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, <coughs> so, it's good to see Andrew as well, just notice him there. <laughs> It really is great to see you. It really is great to see you back. It's great to see you. Okay. Looking forward to seeing you later. Okay. Um, we're going to sing and uh, a little song, Psalm 131. Yeah. We pray that this will be true of us, that we'll uh, be um, not <coughs> trying to be too smart or too great, but just like a little children, trust in God today. Let's sing some if you want. Man became a living being, an act 
act of creation by the Creator. <coughs> so, this may be then where we should go to find out about ourselves in the Bible and as a kind of how we came to be, so that we can understand ourselves and understand why we are the way we are. Why are we like this? Why is the human race very clearly struggling? We can't blame, you know, we can't blame the climate, we can't blame, um, you know, the stars in the sky or the fish in the sea. Uh, we're struggling because <coughs> of what we are. And it's so obvious that we don't even notice it. We struggle, and the human race is struggling today, and not because things are difficult around us, though often they are. We struggle because of what we are. Because we make so many of the problems that we have in our world. And it's so obvious, yet it's so unseen. What I want to try and do uh, this week and next week, and then we'll pick it up again in January, uh, after Christmas and the year is to try and help us to understand what the Bible teaches that you are that I am you know and that Rishi Sunak is and Joe Biden is and Elon Musk and all these people that we see all the time on our television screens and our news what are people, what are we and I'm preaching this because it's something that society doesn't reflect on very much. And when it does reflect on it, it tends to be biased because, you know, none of it, it's not easy for us to be honest about ourselves. All of us like to big ourselves up. We like to uh, present our best bits. I mean, we don't need to look to social media to see that. Uh, we're not really being honest about ourselves. So it's very difficult for human beings to be objective. So we need to go to some outside source to tell us about ourselves, and that's what the Bible gives us. So because we don't understand ourselves, as I hope we'll see in these studies over the next perhaps five weeks or so that we look at these things, uh, it causes all kinds of problems. Uh, and it makes us very confused sometimes and very vulnerable to making bad, bad mistakes. But let me start today uh, by thinking about whether we're animals. Are you an animal? Well, Patrick knew the answer to that. Um, but Jiminy Cricket didn't. Remember Jiminy Cricket? Um, so this is what we're doing today. Help us understand what we are and why we need Jesus. Jimmy Cricket was a very annoying creation of Walt Disney. And he had a song which he sang in the 1950s. And uh, you can find it on YouTube if you want. You are a human animal. If you ever come across that, you're too young to remember that. Part. But this is what Jimmy Cricket was presenting to the kids of the Western world in the 1950s. It was the latest scientific thinking, because that was Jimmy Cricket. He was all about teaching the kids about science and about the world and telling them to be smart and not to be. And this is what the thinking was. You're a human animal. You're a very special breed. You're the only animal who can think, which is not true at first. I know my cat thinks. I can definitely tell you that. Who can think, who can reason, who can read. Well, are you an animal? That's too many cricket. And uh, a lot of uh, modern teachers would say that we are. The idea comes usually from the, the a particular understanding of the fossil record and of the bone record, and we call that evolution. And uh, it, it says that human beings are just the latest iteration of animal nature, produced by the survival of the fittest, uh, the survival of the smartest, the survival of the most ruthless. 
In other words, taking at face value of what evolutionary science teaches is that you are the most ruthless animal on the planet. And it's not difficult to believe that. I mean, we are annihilating all the other animals on the planet. We have been doing for a very, very long time. So you're just an animal if you just go with um, a particular understanding. Notice I'm saying that I'm not questioning the science, I'm questioning the interpretation. A particular understanding would say you're just a ruthless animal. That's what it is, taking a face value. We don't, as human beings, tend to like that, but that's what we're being told by many evolutionary teachers. We're just basically the winners in the rat race of creation. No, not creation in their minds, uh, just having chance. We're just those that happen to be able to make better tools and to cooperate better together and to win out against the wolves and the tigers and you know all the and, uh, parasites and all other things that, that uh, would we'll try and get the better of us. We are the ones that have come out of this spot. We are animals. We're just the best animals. Now, of course, people don't like that. And uh, even though they might believe it's true, they push back against it all the time. You notice that. For example, um, if someone's behaving really badly, they will say, he's just behaving like an animal. And the implication there is that, well, the rest of us are not animals, but they are. And also, we don't, while we admire animals often, we don't want to be like them. Uh, for example, we admire our hound stags. But if I presented myself as someone who said, well, you know, I am going to try to kill all the other males, and I am going to inseminate all the females in order to, pre to preserve my genes exclusively, um, I'd be locked up. If that was what I was trying to do, well, that's what, that's what stags do. So we push back against that. We say, well, actually, maybe we are animals, but um, we don't want really to think of ourselves in that way. And also, you see this, even although we see society moving away uh, from church at the moment, from the teaching of Jesus, still people want to live for it. And that's something that is uh, not something we can find happening on animals, as far as we can understand. So the question is, are we really animals? Is human nature really animal nature? Or are we something else? And that's where we return uh, to the Bible. Uh, because if we don't turn to the Bible, then really that's the conclusion we have to leave ourselves with. We're animals, and maybe a greater animal will emerge that will annihilate or get the better of us, or maybe just, uh, you know, we'll end up as, as a race fighting among ourselves until the strongest people with the best weapons win. And of course, we guess we're trying to avoid that, but we're doing it all over the world today. Uh, at the present time, there are many, many wars. The Bible presents us with a, a, a much more uh, wholesome and clear picture. It tells us about a creator and it tells us about a creation. If you come to the Bible and you ask the question, what is human nature? Then, <clears throat> first, I mean, there's four things I just want to pick up from the verses you look at. And the first is, human nature is created. It's a created nature. Very simple, two verses there. God says, let us make man, and it says the Lord God formed the man. We are, so this first man is a creature, is a created being. So there is, there's some kind of break between anything that's been before and the man. So that's important. But at the same time, we're made of the same stuff. 
It's not like we're made of some different atoms that um, you can find anywhere else. We're made of the same stuff. The Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. God can do that, Jesus said. God can raise, raise our children of Abraham from the stones. God can make whatever he wants with his creation. And we know that we're the same stuff as creation because obviously you know, we, we return to the dust. So the Lord God formed the man from the dust. And, and then, of course, when we return to the dust, and uh, we're just the same stuff as, as everything else. But we're created. There's a new beginning there. There's something new happening. Some more things. <clears throat> Let us make man, says God, in our image. So we've got this connection with God in our likeness, and let them rule, and of course over the fish of the sea and the animals and so on. So we stand in God's creation, not as animals, we're not right there with the animals, just part of the <coughs> animal kingdom. We're not there with God, we're not gods, but we're somewhere in between. We are made in God's image, in his likeness, and so we have an ability to, to relate to God. Uh, and we have the ability to relate to, relate to the animals, but we have dominion. Now, obviously, many people would say, oh, there's the Bible, it's a bad thing, like dominion over the animals, and look what we've done with it. But, well, God did not tell us to destroy the animals. He didn't tell us uh, to, to wipe out the species of the earth, as we're, as we're very clearly doing. Uh, we've misused the rule that he's given us. It's meant to be a caring role. It's meant to be a harmonious role that we have. But it's not, sadly, it's been abused. Our role has been, uh, and our role has been abused. But we stand as creatures, the same stuff of the creation, uh, but a new beginning, somewhere between God and the animals, and more than animals. Uh, so in chapter 2 verse 7, God breathed into the, the, the inanimate creation, the inanimate human, the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. And the word there, the soul is the word that we find right through the Old Testament, there's another word uh, in the New Testament, different language, with that sense of man being more than the physical. Like you can't reduce human beings only to the bodily parts or the cells or the atoms that make them up. There's more than that. There's something beyond that, something that continues. So when you come to Ecclesiastes, you know, Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7, Solomon in Ecclesiastes says, when we die, the body returns to the dust where it came from and the soul returns to God who gave it. And that's a, a, a completely different understanding than we can have of the animals. So we are created. We are body and spirit, body and soul. We stand between the animals and God. We are a new beginning in the creation. But is this true? What's the really an animal? The Bible clearly presents them as historical persons because there's a genealogy that starts there and there's real people following on from their children and their children's children and so on. And there's a genealogy that goes right through the Bible and brings it up to Jesus. Jesus himself it speaks about the man and the woman. Paul speaks about Adam. Jude speaks about Adam. And various places throughout the Bible present these historic people as being real. And, you know, that may be enough for many of us. Just, well, the Bible says this, and it tallies with our Christian experience, and we're, we're happy there, and that's great. It's great. You know, everyone's happy with that, and many people are very deeply skeptical of that. Yeah, and they question it, because evolution also has believers, 
and it also has a genealogy. Uh, so the two things have the genealogy of the Bible and the evolution. Both have genealogies and they both have believers. Uh, and in evolution, the genealogy seems to begin with a simple life and through more and more complex life it's recorded in the record, in the fossils, and then in the bones in the last perhaps few million years that are, are still surviving. There's a record of species that are not present in the world anymore and that go from very simple more, through more and more complex until we arrive at today and it is a genealogy too and it's, it's a fact um, that, that that's present as well. So we have to try and understand how to work with two things. We've got the genealogy of the Bible and we've got the genealogy of evolution. And what we need to be very careful with is how we present this as Christians. We need to be very careful we present it to the world in a way that harmonizes the two. We mustn't say to people out there, oh, your evolution is all rubbish, the Bible's right. Uh, and in the same way, we hope they won't say to us, your Bible's a little rubbish, your evolution's right. Uh, but that often is the stalemate that happens. Uh, and it's a very destructive thing. And it's very hard for kids to grow up with that. If they have that kind of pressure, when I go to church on Sunday and they say that it was Adam and Eve, uh, and I go to my science class on Monday morning and they say there was evolution. And, uh, we, you know, often church has done this. We've said science against the Bible. And we mustn't do that because God made them both. The, the fossils are real. You know, we can pick them up and handle them. I can see in this, in this rock here. I can see part of a shell of an uh, and uh, it's a rock. It tells me it's very, very, very old. Because things, rocks don't form quickly. So there's something real there. Uh, and the Bible is also presented to us something real. So we mustn't set the two against each other because God created both. Unless you believe, of course, God created the world with fossils in it, uh, which bizarrely some people do believe. As so the God created the world with all the fossils in it as a kind of test for us, will we believe the Bible or will we believe that really these fossils were living creatures? In which case we're abandoning God. But that would be to make God, I think, both a tempter and a deceiver, and he's neither. Now these fossils are there because they were once living creatures. So what science is trying to do is to find out about God's creation. It's, it's looking at creation. It's looking at the fossils and it's looking at the bones. And the bones are as real as the Bible. So we can't set them against each other. We must teach respect both for the Bible and for the bones and the fossils and the science. Because it's impossible for them to be in uh, in disharmony because they both come from God. But as we're going to see in this short series, the problem is not with science, it's with science. The science is just trying to find out what's there, but it's how we interpret what we find. And the problem also is with the Christians. Because the Bible is there, but it's how we interpret what we find in the Bible. And so often, Christians and scientists can, can uh, interpret what they find in science and in the Bible for their own ends. For political ends, for personal gain, uh, to prove a point or to keep in with a certain group of people. Uh, and that is why there is so much tension over these things in the world. We need to get past that. And we need to have proper, respectful talking between the two. And of course, there are many people who embody both a Christian faith and a scientific worldview. And um, who both study the world and try to understand it from who it has come from and how it is as it is, and who study their Bibles and love Jesus Christ. So, what we need to see is the two are true. It's just a case of making 
be sure we interpret them the right way so that they fit together. And that, that isn't always easy um, because um, both the way that we interpret the Bible and the way we interpret the science uh, is not set in stone in the way the fossils are. And how God could use the development of life throughout the ages uh, to bring us to where we are today, well, he knows that, and I don't. And how could he create Adam from the dust? He knows that, and I don't. There are questions that, as we sang in Psalm 151, are beyond us, and we need to, we need to understand that. But uh, from Adam, human nature means, what human nature is, that you and I, people, special creation of God, not animals, between animals and God, and with everlasting spirits, that people uh, can walk with God and can live forever. That's a very wonderful thing, and we thank God that it's true, we thank God that we're not animals, and that we have this great destiny that Jesus himself so completely embodied in his teaching and his life and in his resurrection. But one more thing to mention today for you and for me is um, how do we approach our relationship with God? What does our nature make possible for us? Like, is it my will or is it God's will? My will or thy will? So we come back to Genesis, and this is chapter 2. And here's a critical verses that uh, God says that he put the man in the garden to work and take care. That's the kind of rule that was intended, a caring rule. And the Lord commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. God had been walking with Adam and Eve, and there was no rules. But God said, well, let's see if the creature knows his and her, her creator. Let's see if the creature knows his or her place before the creator. Here's one very simple rule, such an easy rule to keep, you would think. Such a very, very easy rule to keep. And I had contemplated doing a kids' address this morning, having all the kids sit around a cent in a circle with a big plate of chocolate from them and just say, you're not allowed to eat that. And just sit here for a wee while as a congregation and see what would happen. And the kids would sweat and they would salivate and they would snatch and they would scoff. <laughs> uh, I'm sure I thought maybe it was a bit too, too unpredictable. But uh, this was the test. And it was a fruit. And God was asking simply, now what I've created, is this man, is this woman, capable of maintaining the distinction between me and them? I'm God, they're a creature. Very simple, very simple thing. And of course, the test was failed. Along comes this third party, and this test had already happened in the heaven and realms. And this was the evil one, Satan. He says, don't listen to God. He knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So this was the temptation. You won't be a creature. You'll be like God. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for fruit, and good for food, pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. <coughs> and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So our human nature is like this. Our human nature may choose to overthrow its role as a creature. We're capable of doing that. I'm not going to spend time on this. This is the Westminster Confession statement. 
and uh, this is about what we're thinking about. We can look at it yourself later. But in the middle there, the words, the possibility of transgression. Transgression. That is us. We can transgress. We don't have a nature that can't go wrong. We're not machines. We have wills. And we have a nature that can desire the wrong, but choose not to do it. But we have a nature that can desire the wrong and see that we could have a role that we didn't think we could have. That we could become God. Or that we being a man could become a woman. Or that we being a husband could be unfaithful in our role to our wife, in our relationship with our wife. Or that we uh, being an employee <coughs> could take some of the money from our employer, or that we being a citizen could find ways to not fulfil our taxation responsibilities to our government, our rulers, our roles in society that we have as human beings, the places that God has put us in as creatures in his creation. We are capable of seeing the rules and saying, not for me, I want to be something else that I was never meant to be. I want to be God, ultimately. I want to be, that's what Eve was presented with. You can be like God. And that is another aspect of yours and of my human nature, unfortunately. I cannot explain this. I mean, we can explain it in terms of free will, but we don't really understand what we mean when we talk about things like that. No, in the dance, people have thought about this for a thousand years ago, about free will and uh, responsibility, how God could give us free will and how God could make us in a way that we would actually be wrong when he's a perfect God. These are questions I think it's a waste of time to think much about compared to just acknowledging the fact that God has given you new roles. We've got roles in our family. We've got parents maybe, or children, or the brothers, or the sisters. And we've got roles in the workplace. We've got people under us. We've got people over us. We've got people in the team. And we've got roles in our neighbourhood. We have responsibilities towards our neighbours. We've got roles you know, in our manage. We've got roles in uh, our being members of the community. Uh, maybe we've got special thing, places and responsibility there. Maybe we've been given uh, things to do in, in the club or you know, in, in, a, in a trust or body or whatever. And we've got roles there. We've got roles in relationship to money. We've got roles in relationship to society and to government and to the law of the land. We've got lots and lots of roles. And it's not just someone saying to us, don't need that one through. That was easy. And even then, we lost the plot. But this is our human nature. That we, seeing something we are denied, want it. And above all, most of all, as the story tells us, we want to be our own gods. That's going to put us out of tune with other people who also want to be God, and it's certainly going to put us out of tune with God himself. So, this is, this is the, the, where we're going to leave it today. So, out for a walk this week, I met a man who has an outdoor job, and I said to him, after a bit of conversation, do you think about God when you're out working in his, in his beautiful creation? He said, all I think about is getting to the end of the day and getting home safely.
Well, we all have rules before God and us, the way many people are thinking, I guess. Um, and that's a denial of God. It's a denial of being a creature. It's a denial of your place in God's world. Sounds very simple and innocuous, but it isn't. We have natures that want to be our own gods. And that means sometimes we stoop to be like animals. And to have that kind of nature is going to have all kinds of implications for our lives and the way we behave and our relationships and the world that we live in and what it's going to be like. Today, man is trying to do things right. With that nature, we're trying to do things right. I guess we always did. We know which things are bad. And the religions of the world are all man's attempts to do what only God can do. Now, only God can save us. But we want to be our own gods and save ourselves. That's another, that's just like taking the fruit all over again. It's like saying, okay, you've given me Jesus, but I want to do it myself. Jesus is God being God, seeing that we cannot rescue ourselves, providing the gift of righteousness and eternal life and salvation through Jesus for us, and say, it's yours. And then we say, no thank you, I want to be God and do it myself. That's the nature that we have. But let's not choose that road, none of us. And let's encourage the people around us uh, not to choose that road either, because it is a road to despair. Because we're not God, we're just little creatures. And we always will be until the day we die, uh, and then we have to face up to the consequences of how we lived. Let us be people who live with God as God in our lives, with Jesus as Savior in our lives, and seeking to honor all the precious and wonderful roles that God has given us to live with Him. Amen. We're going to sing. Uh, <coughs> Stand to sing now and uh, thank God for the Savior for Jesus, uh, who is uh, God's provision for us. Before the throne of God above, I was strong and perfect. Let's stand, let's sing together. <laughs>
blessing of God Almighty, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon and remain with each one of you, now and always. Amen.